Welcome, everybody. I'm Tom Anderson, and this is Webinar on Wednesday with Destinations Together. As always, a warm welcome to our Zoom listeners and cruise line executives that are tuning in. This particular week is exciting because we're talking with tour operators that are actually preparing for tourists. To stay in line with the guidelines, tour operators and guests will both need to pack their flexibility along with their mask and gloves. Before we start with our featured speakers, who are literally at the leading edge of tourism, I wanted to provide a quick update on cruise news and our COVID economy. The startling headlines of cruise industry news yesterday was, world travel remains at a standstill. The World Tourism Organization reported that 100% of global destinations continue COVID-related restrictions on travel, and 72% of destinations have completely closed their borders to international tourism. Nevertheless, we're hoping that the no sale orders from the CDC will end as scheduled on July 24th so we can start cruising again. However, there are still tens of thousands of cruise workers on the ships stuck at sea, which is continuing to generate negative press. Royal Caribbean announced a $3.3 billion bond offering today to ensure their long-term liquidity. Carnival Corp announced the layoff of 450 in the UK. On a positive note, cruise lines are reporting robust bookings for 2021. So with these headlines as the backdrop, there is no doubt that the world economy and the cruise industry are still in turmoil, but there are green shoots. The all-inclusive Sandals Resorts have announced their opening. Palace Resorts have communicated an extremely thorough sanitation program to ensure guest safety. Disney Springs plans to open next week and Disney Shanghai opened last Monday. Tickets sold out in minutes. So there is proof that tourism will survive the pandemic and we are not destined to be digital nomads. Today, we will hear from two tour operators that are neck deep in the process to get ready for their first tourists along the Eastern seaboard. They have been forced to radically evaluate and reimagine their business. And in fact, Historic Tours of America are already operating now in a couple of ports. Today's presentation is hosted by Destinations Together, which is an open platform of relevant information and collaboration to support the cruise industry and to support you, the tour and port operators. It is designed to help everyone connect, collaborate, and hopefully find solutions to bridge the gap until cruise ships and tourism returns to your region. Please visit our website, www destinationstogether.com and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Also, don't miss next week's webinar on Wednesday to learn about the science of sanitation and the online GBAC classes available to get trained to keep your team, guests, and business safe. I'll turn this over to Larry to share some important information and then introduce our speakers for today's Destinations Together webinar on Wednesday. Hey, thanks, Tom. Many thanks to all of you for joining us today. We also want to recognize our guest speaker from last week, Dr. Lori Pennington Gray, Director of Tourism Crisis Management Initiative at University of Florida in Gainesville. You can watch the recording of last week's webinar on our website, so check it out, some real good intel. Before we get started, let me remind you of a few important housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar and we will upload it on our website in the next few days. There is a Q&A tab below on your screens. Feel free to send through questions or comments. If time permits, we will present the questions to John and Dennis at the end of the presentations. You can also vote on any questions you see in the Q&A to help ensure we include the most relevant ones. After the presentations, we will pause for a quick poll to gauge everybody's impression on the session today and ask a few pertinent questions. Please remember, we and our guests are only providing our opinions and possible sources for further intel. With all that behind us, let me introduce our featured speakers from these two companies are likely to be some of the first in North America to receive tourists later this spring. 
John Welby, Historic Tours of America, will present on an overview of their tour business situated in various U.S. cities. He will explain how they have coordinated with the CDC to comply with sanitation standards, guidelines, and how they are addressing the operational challenges of social distancing to keep their staff and guests safe. Dennis Campbell is founder and CEO of Ambassador Tours Gray Line, Eastern Canada's largest and water sightseeing tour company. He will provide a brief of his multifaceted company for the benefit of those unfamiliar with Ambassador Tours. He will then discuss how they radically adjusted their business plan to maximize both revenue and guest satisfaction, while also meeting the sanitation requirements of Health Canada and ensuring the safety of their guests and frontline teams. Dennis and John, we are so happy to have you join us today, and we really look forward in you sharing your reopening plans with us over the next 45 minutes or so. Dennis, are you ready? Take the show. Larry, I am ready. Well, I don't, hold on, there you go. I don't know if we could see that. I like to have the show, so thanks for giving me the show, Larry. All right, well, thanks very much, uh, Tom and Larry. Um, I'll begin by just starting to say that uh, both John and I are dealing with different issues, and so we've tried to take a bit of a different tact, uh, although we're also dealing with many of the same issues, but uh, uh, John is open in some locations and we're not open in any locations, and we're not allowed to be open uh, for some time. Uh, we are hoping that, and we believe that, our government will allow us to open by July 1, as, uh, from what we're hearing right now. So we'll begin, um, and I'll start by uh, explaining our locations. Um, this next slide will show you uh, a, a quick view of our operating locations relative to the U.S. border, uh, and all, they're all on the eastern side of Canada, from the Maritime Provinces to Niagara Falls. And I'd like to uh, quickly tell you a little bit about our company to help, help you to understand the challenges that we're facing. Um, so we've been operating for 33 years. We have three divisions in five Canadian provinces. Um, the three divisions are cruise ship shore excursions, uh, which is sightseeing by, by uh, bus, boat, um, meals in a restaurant, and so on. Uh, our, our number one product is our hop-on, hop-off product, but we have tours to various other locations, uh, shore excursions in the Maritimes. Uh, our second division is our Murphy's on the water, which in, includes uh, six vessels, uh, plus another six uh, harbor hopper amphibious vessels, uh, a 350 seat restaurant on the Halifax waterfront and four gift shops. And in Niagara Falls, we have a uh, gray line uh, double decker hop on hop off operation, which of course has nothing to do with cruise ships. Um, we'll go to the next slide and uh, just tell you a little bit of our, our situation. So we're not operating in any location, as I said, and, and right now the date is unknown, and we hope and believe uh, we'll be open, ready to be open July 1, and we're making plans for that. Um, and so uh, I'll start by saying we have, um, uh, the situation is no seasonal hiring uh, for over 500 staff. Uh, we have no hiring uh, on the immediate horizon and one third of our uh, year-round uh, core staff are, are laid off. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our key activities. Um, first, um, our staff, we're, we're, we're trying to take care of our staff. And I'll, I'll just mention, sorry, we have, we go, just go back a slide there. Uh, we have 240 staff uh, in our uh, short excursion division, 250 staff in our uh, water uh, tour restaurants and, and gift shops and, and 40 staff in, in Niagara Falls and then 35 year-round staff. So we, we could go to the next slide. So as it relates to staffing, um, right away as we, as everything started to shut down, we, we, it was very, very important to us to figure out a way to take care of our staff. Um, you know, our staff are, are, are seasonal, they're seniors who have been with us for years and students who uh, both who rely on, on us for income. Uh, we use our networks to uh, help find them temporary jobs in retail to tie them over the season uh, or even through the year. Uh, we're keeping them uh, f fully employed and regularly uh, hosting, sorry, fully informed and regularly hosting them uh, on Zoom calls and drop-in sessions regularly to help keep them the connection and uh, support their mental health. Um, uh, in particular, with the uh, finding them work, 
uh, we, we, we recognized that there were some businesses that uh, were, were busier through COVID. And so we reached out to a, a national grocery store chain and we said, you're hiring, we've got great people. Uh, they are hardworking, they've got great attitudes, and um, many of them were ready, willing, and able to go to work, and they have. And that led to uh, about three other major companies uh, reaching out to us saying, we need staff, and they've uh, taken these uh, uh, 400 or so staff that unfortunately we cannot employ. Of course, it came with the risk of what do we do in terms of um, uh, if, if we have to go get back to work sooner than, than we might have imagined. And uh, we, we said it's a risk we were prepared to take uh, based on the fact that these people need work um, and also based on the fact that, uh, that we, 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 we took the risk that they don't really want to be stocking grocery shelves or sewing surgical gowns or working on construction sites, of which many of them are, uh, and that once crews and, and, and tourism came back that they'd, they'd want to come back to us. So that's, that's what we are, are banking on and we believe. Um, just talking about our, our partners, we're reimagining our partner relationships. Um, for example, we're working with a, a high traffic tourist town that has recently closed due to, uh, to, to use buses, to use our buses to manage and control uh, the entrance when they reopen um, a little place called Niagara on the Lake near Niagara Falls. Uh, we're using our double deckers to assist other partners with transit needs due to une unexpected uh, uh, physical distancing where they, they need more buses because uh, they, they can only take so many people on their buses. Um, we've uh, organized sector-wide high-profile tourism partners to lobby governments, uh, both provincially and at, a, at the federal level, um, we, with the belief that there's power in numbers and to have a stronger voice um, together. Um, we're helping our, our suppliers with financial uh, and or HR assistance. Um, and, and what we recognized early on is that uh, while we knew we had to take care of our own house and prepare the company for long-term survival and and we said you know we ran various models saying worst case scenario we have to think you know what if we have zero income for another year until this time next year and so we've run those run those models we're, we, we're, we are preparing the company to survive uh, with little or no income um, for another year uh, not an easy task but one that uh, we're, we're 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 making great progress on and and I feel very good about it, and I know we'll, we'll, we'll get through. Uh, but we looked around and we said, many of our key partners and suppliers uh, do not have the uh, senior financial acumen internally, um, and, and, and they're not uh, spending or wanting to spend $300 an hour to get the right kind of um, uh, financial experience to help uh, guide them through and figure out how do you make a company survive with little or no income for another year. And, you know, uh, we're not, we haven't charged for that and we can't do it for everybody, but we're doing it as much as we can for our key suppliers. And it's incredible to see some really good companies that, uh, you know, without this assistance, I, I don't know if they would have made it. And, and now they're on their path to survival in the long term. And so we're taking great pride in that, in helping as many as we can. Uh, and, and as soon as we get our, our house fully in order, we're going to do more of that because we have two senior uh, Ernst Young executives that and that's not why we hired them. But I got to tell you, going through COVID, it really has made a huge difference for us uh, to make sure that we uh, uh, survive long term. Um, safety. Uh, we're using the time that we have to uh, rec reconfigure our facilities, uh, make pr uh, preparations for uh, post-COVID procedures, uh, distancing, sanitation. Um, John's going to go into a little bit more detail about wh what they've done. And, and already we're, we're learning uh, tremendously from John as we have over the years because uh, they're, they're such a, a terrific operator that uh, are very diversified and very forward thinking and creative. So um, other provinces in Canada have opened quickly. Uh, Nova Scotia right now looks to be the last to, to develop a plan for opening, uh, but we've got to be ready. And so we're working on that. Um, finally, I'll mention uh, virtual tours, um, uh, keeping not only our company and products uh, um, on the forefront, but our destination in mind uh, for visitors uh, for the future. Uh, so we've started producing uh, nostalgic, enticing virtual sample tours. Uh, these are being used by our DMOs, 
um, for a new see and stay local market campaign because with uh, our provincial and our, and our federal borders closed, the only market that we can uh, go after right now is the local market. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of within a two hour radius within the province of Nova Scotia. Um, and so uh, we don't know when the Canada-US border will open and we're, we're looking forward to that. But right now our total market size is a little over 900,000 people in the province of Nova Scotia. And so as we go to the, the next slide, so these are a few tips uh, for getting through COVID um, that you know, we've been working on. We've been saying to our, our uh, key staff that are still employed full time, or uh, I should say 80% uh, of the time because no one's working full time. Um, the, you know, the, the extreme need to be nimble. Uh, we have to think ahead of all eventualities and prepare for them so we can flip uh, the switch if, we get, if and when we get the chance. Um, guests will be evaluating whether to take our experience firstly as to whether they are protected from the virus then secondly for the actual experience um, secondly we're, we're simplifying our tours we are uh, reimagining the product uh, reducing risks such as stops on our hop on hop off um, and the number of passengers on tour uh, we're also not sure whether or not we're going to be able to serve food, food and beverage on our vessels uh, we do believe that we'll be able to in our restaurant and while it's not a great time to own a restaurant, if you're gonna own one, uh, might as well have a big one. And we do have the biggest restaurant in Halifax. So, you know, we, we take some comfort in that. But also in our gift shops, our four gift shops, we don't think locals will be buying uh, the, the type of merchandise that is really focused around visitors. So what we're, we're planning on doing is taking a lot of the merchandise out of our gift shops, uh, making it more like a grocery store where you can follow the arrows and walk through uh, you know, sort of single file uh, in safe distance. And then we're going to uh, take a lot of the merchandise. And with our restaurant being so big, but now with social distancing, we're planning to take some of the merchandise and put it through the restaurant to help m make it feel uh, less empty uh, and, and help make it more of an experience with the social distancing. Um, and then uh, also our theory is that people will want to get out in the fresh air uh, with each other. So sailing, uh, we believe will be appealing on our tall ship and our other vessels and uh, as well possibly our hop on hop off um, and our, our, our harbor hoppers, which I'll, you'll see a little bit more about here in a moment. Um, also, we're, we're sharing our best practices uh, with whoever wants to listen. Um, we truly believe that we are all in this together and that we can learn so much from each other. Uh, there's no, no point in reinventing the wheel. We, we feel it's a time to be very generous with each other. And so we've even reached out to competitors and we've said to them, hey, listen, uh, this is a time to help. Uh, we're, you're a good competitor, we're a good competitor. Um, and so we're actually prepared to share with you the financial measures we've taken as a company to make sure that we survive for the long term. Some of you, you might say, that's crazy. You know, why would you ever do that? Well, again, this, this is a time to, to step up and we think you know, it'll, it'll help uh, serve us better in the long term by, by helping each other, uh, partners, suppliers, um, and even some good competitors. Um, number four, uh, government, we're staying connected with many departments uh, are, are suddenly uh, interrelated, like Transport Canada for our boat operations is now connected to Health Canada. Uh, that. Um, we're keeping our staff informed. Even if we can't bring them back, we know that we'll be re remembered, not for whether we employed them, but for how we treated them during this ordeal. Um, our bankers, uh, we are keeping in very close touch with our lenders. Um, they want to help. They want um, our business to succeed. And I have to tell you, in 33 years in business, uh, certainly had some touchy times with banks. And I got to say, I'm, I'm pleasantly um, pleased with how our, our lenders are, are, are working with us to make sure that we get through this. But I think it comes from open, honest, and clear communication with them and, and, and uh, not uh, hiding anything. So, um, ending on a happy note, um, there's a very real, real possibility that we may not operate this season in any division, but we have our plans in place and we will emerge out of this in 2021. We believe that we have done the right thing um, at all decision points during this unprecedented uh, situation. And finally, I'd like to show you that virtual tour I told you about. Um, this is a virtual tour that is of the Harbor Hopper. It's not with commentary. 
uh, but it is, uh, it has, it's lighthearted, it's fun, it's with music, it gives you a feel for, a taste for what you can do and have when you uh, come out of, your, out of your house. We think there's a lot of pent up demand and we're also working on one for our Hop On Hop Off tour. Uh, on Zoom, this doesn't come across as clearly as it does when you, when you, with a direct link, but it gives you an idea. So it's a little choppy uh, and the sound isn't quite as good, but it's, it's good enough uh, to give you a feel for this. It's about a, a minute or so long and we'll, we'll play it now um, and hope you, hope you enjoy it. So we don't have any sound, but we'll keep playing it because I think it's going to be sound. So uh, everyone, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Um, it's been my pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, now I'd like to uh, hand it back to Tom and Larry, uh, and then John, uh, who's a far better singer and way better cookier, cookie maker than I am. Tom, you're on mute. Okay, there we go. Dennis, thank you. And, and uh, I love the Harbor Hopper. It's so much fun. I, and that was just an awesome overview of how you and your team are navigating through this challenging time. And um, I also think it's remarkable how open you are in this time to share these best practices and, and to really um, try to make sure everyone, everyone finds a way uh, through this pandemic time whether whether they're a fierce competitor or whether they're just a colleague, and I, I think I think that's just awesome. I think that's the way it should be. Well done. And John, are you uh, are you all set? Yes, sir. I'm ready to go. All right, John, take it away. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Tom and Larry, and thank you to everyone who is attending. And Dennis, appreciate it. I'm going to get my little screen set up here. So. <clears throat> All right. So um, just for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is John Welby and I am the National Cruise Ship Liaison for Historic Tours of America. I've been with this company for 23 years in a variety of roles. Um, spent 10 years in the Boston operation as an ops manager and then five years as a general manager and been involved with the cruise business since 2005. And um, in my new role as National Cruise Ship Liaison since 2018. And I have the privilege of being able to split my time half the year in Key West in the winter and the other half here in Boston in the summer. Um, the company is Historic Tours of America. And we operate tours and attractions in seven cities throughout the US. We operate in Key West, St. Augustine, Savannah, Washington, Boston, Nashville, and San Diego. And uh, main product would be the Old Town Trolley Tour, but as you can see by the logos there on your screen, we have quite a few different things that we operate. Uh, we operate the Conk Tour Train in Key West, Ghost and Gravestones in many of our cities, uh, San Diego Seals, which is an amphibious tour in San Diego, the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum, American Prohibition Museum, the Old Jail in St. Augustine, 
um, oldest store in San Augustine, Potter's Wax Museum, Key West Aquarium, the list goes on and on. We also have uh, partnerships with the National Park Service where we operate the Arlington Cemetery Service as well as the Yankee Freedom um, Ferry to the Dry Tortugas. And we operate with the state of Florida with the Truman Little White House in Key West. In addition to that, we operate several visitor centers in some of our cities, as well as some food and beverage in some of our cities as well. Uh, we are the only national company that is headquartered in Key West, Florida. And prior to COVID-19, employed over 1,500 people. So um, this next slide here is probably the most important thing. Um, flexibility is the hallmark of our profession. This is something that one of my predecessors used to say almost on a daily basis. It is stuck in my head and it is never more true than it is today. Um, with the current situation being very fluid, we need to adapt and adapt pretty much constantly at this point. So as a company, we have um, a team of folks who have identified some key areas. So I just put up on the screen there some nine key areas that they've identified and that um, each city will need to adapt into their um, the new way of doing things. So uh, number one on that list is a touch point analysis, which is identifying any high touch point areas on our vehicles, at our attractions, and in our facilities. And uh, as part of that, they will be creating a checklist to make sure that we do additional cleaning throughout the day. So there'll be follow through with it as well. Uh, number two on the list is additional sanitation measures. So um, part of that is installing stations in strategic locations, high volume areas uh, on our vehicles, um, near our sales depots, our various attractions and our retail outlets as well. Um, part of the new way of sanitizing and cleaning, we are going to be doing in between each tour on our vehicles. We'll be doing spot cleaning with um, environmentally conscious hydrogen peroxide based product and touching all the, um, the high touch point areas. In addition to that, the nighttime cleaning, which goes on for every vehicle on a daily basis, we'll be using the sanitation process of a chlorine based product with the electrostatic sanitizing process. Um, any facilities that we have, retail stores or office space that have air conditioning units will have UV lights installed and an additional uh, mobile units for more sensitive areas. Uh, next item on that list is cast members. We model ourselves a lot after Disney and we use the same terminology there. Cast members are our employees. So um, the cast is gonna receive additional training um, educating them on how to identify symptoms and bringing up a protocol to address the symptoms. And before anybody reports to work, there will be additional signage in our locations with screening questions, um, all the questions set up per CDC re recommendations. Um, obviously, if we have any guests, and excuse me, any cast members that uh, test positive, we are gonna create a log of those um, and keep track of the actions taken and the follow-up of that. And during, you know, this new way of doing things, the initial phase, pretty much calling phase one, you know, we're gonna relax attendance policies across the country. So obviously if people are gonna be out for extended periods of time, um, we have to take that into consideration and be a little more flexible with that. Um, the use of masks is gonna be required for cast members whenever they're within six feet of another person. They must have a, ca a mask on their person at all times. And we will have them available for guests and encourage guests to wear them, but we're not making it mandatory for guests to wear them. Um, any of our casts that are involved with the sanitizing of our vehicles and locations will receive additional training on the protocol for, that tr for the new cleaning systems. Um, underneath the cast, we also have a communication plan for the cast. And this is something we found very valuable all along. Since the initial shutdown of all of our operations, um, most of our cities have, if not all, stayed in contact with the cast um, via emails or constant contact. And it's been a very useful tool. I can speak directly for the Key West operation where I spent um, the majority of the last eight weeks 
And um, it was really great to see on a daily basis an email coming through with not just, hey, how you doing, but helpful things, links to resources and such. And um, also ways to keep the cast engaged by um, having them send in pictures of things that they're doing during the shutdown, et cetera. Um, part of the communication plan will be for um, getting the word out about what the sterilization, the cleaning, the social distancing all is. So um, let me show you a picture of one of the new signs we've created. This one, I love this. So this is one of the graphics that our marketing department put together. As you can see, it focuses on the key areas of the social distance and uncleanliness. So obviously wash your hands frequently, cover your face, uh, wear face masks six feet apart. And you'll see at the top, keep your party together. I'll go into a little bit more later on when I talk about the actual tours, but um, you know, we're gonna be doing spacing on our vehicles. However, if it's groups of four or six that are traveling together, we will accommodate them if they're already together to keep them together and not spread them out. Um, as part of the social distancing messaging, um, you know, we're in tourism and haven't been a tour guide for many years. Our folks rely on gratuities and obviously we don't want to do anything to impede that. So we still encourage gratuities, but we're going to encourage folks to have no direct contact with the guests. If they're going to give a tip, throw it in the tip app versus handing it directly to one of our tour conductors. One of the more important things for our company on a daily basis is our daily briefings where we get the entire team together in each city and we go over the important points for the day you know um you know what sort of birthdays or anniversaries are happening museums special events it's an important part of what we do but obviously with social distancing that becomes a challenge so um, under the phase one of our reopening uh, we're suggesting to our cities to whenever possible hold our briefings outdoors so maybe in the parking lot or someplace where we can do the social distancing um for social distancing as well when it comes to lines and queues you know we're going to do what a lot of other places have done put markings on the ground to encourage people to stay a safe safe distance from each other um, the additional signage all around our vehicles and our depots um, encouraging the use of face masks and also additional sanitation spots so Anywhere we can, we'll put the hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer devices. Some of them will be on the vehicles, some will be at the sales depots, and some will be at our retail locations. Uh, as far as our vehicles are concerned, um, in addition to the cleaning I already talked about, we are planning on roping off the very first seat behind the tour conductor and then spacing them out so that it's either every other or every third seat is able to be occupied. Another important fact for vehicles uh, to encourage some social distancing will be, you know, we'll start boarding now from the rear of the vehicle forward versus giving people free reign to just get on and sit wherever they want. And then obviously in the reverse when people go to exit the vehicle. And um, as you saw by a graphic a second ago, additional signage, you know, highlighting some of the new protocols, those will be on the vehicles as well. In our various attractions where we operate so many different museums, uh, we will deter groups of more than 10 people. And if necessary, we'll have additional staff that we'll use as a floater that will help to manage the flow of those groups. Uh, facilities, any of our office spaces or other facilities, uh, there'll be new protocols put into place for the front of the house versus back of the house cleaning. Um, and some of the things already mentioned with the checklist, et cetera, going forward. At our sales depots, um, obviously additional cleaning supplies will be available. The sales agents will be responsible for cleaning the depots throughout the day. And then whenever somebody's handling cash, we will encourage the use of um, gloves, whereas uh, before we did not. In our retail locations, uh, floor decals, spacing out folks, additional signage, um, and more cleaning and sanitizing protocols put into place there. Now, as part of all of these new ways of doing things, again, like going back to the beginning with what I said, which is flexibility is the hallmark of our profession. You know, this is what we're putting into place now. And uh, as we go forward, things are going to evolve. 
and will adapt and change things as necessary. Um, with the new protocols and making folks feel safe, we have come up with some key talking points for our cast members. Um, and I just put them up there on the screen for you. So obviously number one safety is our first priority. So key talking points would be the safety and well-being of our guests and team members remains our highest priority. Uh, we are limiting our seating to provide social distancing on each tour. Uh, we are providing hand sanitizer at key boarding locations throughout the city. Between each tour, our vehicles are cleaned at key touch, key touch points with an EPA approved disinfectant. All of our vehicles undergo a deep cleaning procedure on a nightly basis. We are enhancing the cleaning procedures at our sales depots and encourage guests to use cashless transactions. Uh, we are providing face masks to our team members and guests. We are encouraging guests to use them, but do not require them. And uh, most importantly, our cleaning practices meet or exceed all CDC guidelines. And um, part of the social distancing, um, I want to show you a cute little slide here. So I've been back in Boston for a couple of weeks now and took a ride around town and thought I'd share with you some of the landmarks that are practicing social distancing. So you can see the teddy bear outside of Tufts New England Medical Center, Mrs. Malder and eight little ducklings and the statue on the right, if you don't know who that is, that's Bobby Orr in front of the TD Garden. All right. Um, new approach to our key tour product, the hop on hop off tour. So anyone who knows Old Town Trolley, uh, our main bread and butter is the hop on hop off tour. And that's one thing we do operate in every single one of the seven cities that we operate in. So during the phase one of reopening, we are now switching from a free sell ticket to a reservation based ticket. So guests will be required to purchase a specific time. And then with that, we're reducing the capacity on every vehicle. You know, currently our trolleys, depending on the city, hold somewhere from 40 to 45 people and they're being reduced down to 12 to 15, depending on the individual group size. Restricted seating, <clears throat> excuse me, that means um, just what it says, we're gonna rope off certain seats and the only one that'll be able to move that will be uh, the tour conductor if we have larger groups that need to sit together. The biggest change in phase one of our reopening is we are eliminating the traditional hop on hop off service that we've offered all these years. So it's gonna change right now initially to a once around tour. However, depending on the city, that once around tour may have one or two extended stops. So instead of your traditional, we drive around the city, pull in, drop off, pick up and keep going, there may be one or two identified stops where the trolley will pull in, stop for 10 to 15 minutes, let guests get out to visit an attraction and then get back on the same exact vehicle to continue on the tour. And um, any of the cities that are offering the extended stops, um, the boarding and debarking are the important points there. You'll see boarding from the rear to the front and debarking from the front to the rear. Okay. Uh, moving on. So figured I'd give you a quick update on each of the seven cities that HTA operates in. So um, number one there on the list is Boston, which has been shut down since uh, March 17th and um, currently shut down. Um, during the shutdown, though, we have been able to provide an amazing service here in Boston, which is we have partnered with the city and um, our trolley is being driven by some of our managers uh, driving some folks who have recovered from COVID-19 who are actually homeless and picking them up at the medical facility and driving them to uh, the homeless shelters. Um, and to date, we've done probably 30 or so trips with shuttling the homeless COVID survivors around. In addition to that, our partners at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum have organized a farm stand for their employees to help them out during these tough times. Uh, Key West has been shut down since March 17th as well. Um, during the shutdown time, they have organized food drives for the cast members. And this is an interesting thing, I think, as part of the food drives, they've also supplied paper towels and toilet paper to any of our cast that need them. And um, very recently, the folks in Key West had a barbecue lunch 
not just for cast members, but the entire community. And it was a drive through. She has been shut down since March 17th. Um, very strict stay home orders for them. Uh, let's see. Uh, San, San Diego has been shut down since the 17th. Strict stay at home orders there. Nashville has been shut down since the 23rd of March. And um, one of the things that they've done in Nashville, which I thought was interesting, is although it's not specific to COVID, it happened all around the same time. They recently had a tornado in Nashville. So um, the operation in Nashville donated $5,000 to the relief and offered uh, free meal delivery to police officers working overnight shifts. Uh, let's see, the two cities that have reopened, Savannah and St. Augustine. So both of those cities shut down right around the same time, around March 26, 27. And they both started operations again this past um, Friday. And they started operations, just as I mentioned, with the, re the reduced capacity, once around tours. Um, during the shutdown, they also organized food drive in their communities as well as um, in St. Augustine, they also helped with um, renters assistance for some of their cast members. As far as the reopening dates for the other cities, we just don't know yet. It all depends on every city, the government, and um, you know what the local authorities are asking. And I can tell you here in Massachusetts, they just announced that it's a, um, a four phase reopening. And they're going to announce on Monday the 18th who, what industry will be included in which phase of the reopening. So even though they're going to make an announcement on Monday, we still don't know where sightseeing is going to fall in the phases of reopening. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned it or not already, but throughout the shutdown time, the constant contact emails have been really important for us to stay in touch with our staff. Um, it's been a huge tool be able to get information to them keep them updated on what we know as far as when things may may not reopen and um it's given them a chance to be able to stay in touch with us which has been a huge help being stuck in the house nobody loves that so knowing that you're not alone in that scenario has been a huge benefit um let me see if I have anything else. I think I covered everything I have. So let me just see. Yep, that's it. So I just want to say thank you for including me in this conversation. I uh, appreciate it. And um, it's all yours, Tom and Larry. Hey, John. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Really, really some uh, some great uh, information provided. And I love your uh, hop on, hop off uh, plan. Um, and the mass pictures, what a great uh, addition to the presentation. We appreciate it. You need to send them to us because we, we do have a, uh, a mask gallery on our websites. So we'd be happy to post those. Well, um, the efforts that you provided for the trees, free transportation, we talked that a couple of days ago that you mentioned that, and that just still sticks with me. I think it's, it's awesome. And then all the uh, goodwill efforts that you, you've been doing for the, for the cast members. So we really appreciate that. Um, if you could go ahead and stop, there you go, thank you. Um, just overall, John and Dennis, many thanks for the valuable information um, and your plans forward, it was excellent. Um, we would like to take a, a quick uh, uh, poll of everybody before we get into the, uh, the uh, questions and answers. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. There's only two questions here and uh, take a few minutes and we'd love to get your feedback. I'm going to turn that back over to Tom whenever. Okay. Can. Well, while, while the poll's going on, um, we'll, we'll multitask here. Um, so we have received some questions. Probably some of them you might be anticipating, but, but I'll, I'll go ahead and start with the most voted for one. Um, this is probably too, well, this is definitely for both of you. Um, how do you see all these new protocols that you're, uh, placing, putting forward to meet the CDC guidelines, Canada Health, et cetera. How do you see these no, new protocols impacting your pricing strategy? And to, again, to the extent that you can discuss it without divulging any um, you know, privileged information. Well, I can tell you that initially, you know, it's not about making money. 
it's about getting back into business for us. Um, we have not raised the prices or dropped the prices. We're currently charging the same price that we did prior to the shutdown. So it's not about us um, initially making money. We just need to get things rolling again. And as I said early on, it's, we got to be flexible. So things will be reevaluated probably week to week as we go forward. Right. Dennis? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry? Or, or, or are you just not there thinking about the pricing side of it yet? No, I was just uh, doing the poll, uh, just rating as high as I could. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, actually, uh, same as John. You know, it's, it's right now, it's uh, uh, do what you got to do to get back to business. Uh, the, you know, it's, it, it's, it's going to be about being sustainable long term. But in the short term, it's it's uh, delivering a product, uh, employing as many people as we can, and and making sure that we uh, you know are there for the future when the ships come back. Uh, I will say this: that uh, you know locally, we are taking, for example, our amphibious tour that's normally an hour long, and we're we're selling it as a half hour express tour, with a view that we we actually won't discount the price, but we'll sell it as a, a bogo. So you you buy one get get one. Um, so you buy, buy the Express Tour now, we'll give you a, 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 a gift card for a future Express Tour for locals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, that obviously wouldn't work for cruise ship passengers, but uh, that's, it's all about bridging the gap and making sure that we're there when, when uh, the cruise ships come back. Hey, J John, just one quick follow-up and uh, kind of related to Dennis's question about um, providing really tourism for locals. I would imagine, I think it's uh, in Savannah and St. Augustine where you guys are now open. Um, what, what's that response been like? And is it primarily locals that are there and are they, are they enjoying the product? Um, yes, the, the majority of the folks that are going to Savannah and St. Augustine at this point, from my understanding, are either the locals or somebody who's driven um, a short distance to get there from nearby communities. Um, as far as the locals concerned, we've had a program in place for 20 plus years called Hometown Pass where guests Anybody who is a local resident brings a paying guest, they ride for free anyways. And then some of our cities, we do offer uh, what's called um, local Sunday. First Sunday of every month, they get to ride for free. So we already do quite a bit for locals to begin with. Um, and you know, one of the, the things with opening is to show the locals as well, like, hey, you know, things are starting to return to some sort of normal here. So yeah, um, locals are a big part of our success. Yeah. And I, I assume they're also pretty supportive as well. They are. Um, and we're in a, an interesting scenario here because we have a huge cruise business, but we also have a giant portion of our business that has nothing to do with cruise. So, you know, we're kind of juggling both sides of the equation there. Um, but yeah, the locals are a big, big, big part of our success. Okay. Um, this one is coming out of uh, Icy Straight Point. Um, for both of you, with the future being questionable, what is your timeline for hiring uh, 2021 staff? John? Um, well, I can tell you, I don't know the answer to that question for 2021, but I do know that for 2020, um, the hiring was already going really well here in the city of Austin. All that came to a screeching halt. So uh, initially, it's going to be like everything else, a phased in rehiring process. So hopefully we'll be able to hire back most of the staff that was let go and then continue with the hiring efforts that we already had this year for next year as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll just comment it's very similar. Uh, I, other than I will say this, that our internal uh, cruise ship shore excursion staff uh, rather than lay them off, we're repurposing them. Uh, you know, there's still the chance that we'll see some ships uh, in, in the later summer, fall here, but obviously we can't bank on that. So rather than lay those staff off, uh, given that we have, uh, you know, boats and restaurants and, and amphibious vehicles and so on, uh, many of you on the call would know Paula and Tasha, for example. Well, you know, we said to Paula and Tasha, we're not laying you off, but we're gonna repurpose you. Uh, Paula was a tour guide years ago and Tasha was a reservation agent years ago. So um, I told Paula that she's actually going to be the captain of Theodore Tugboat and Tasha is going to be a harbor hopper captain. <laughs> Repurposing. <laughs> Something like that. 
<laughs> um, one question from uh, Matthew. What number of pastures per vehicle are you planning to start uh, when you do start? And I, I know this j jumps around. And I, I, do you look at it as a percentage basis or is it, is it just number of seats and, and a formula there? And I imagine it might be different Canada versus U.S. Well, for, for us, it depends on the size of the vehicle. Uh, but we're trying to limit the tours initially from anywhere from like 10 to 15, depending on the groups. If it's individual groups, it'd probably be 10. If it's a couple of groups with four people in it, it might go up to 15. And those are on vehicles that would typically hold 40 or 45 people. Wow. So that's, so that's much less than 50-50. Yep. Or 50%. Right. Wow. Yeah, and, and for us, it's, it's similar other than we've uh, just started discussions with our local health authority about uh, the, the idea of putting up uh, plexiglass partitions between the seats. So we'd, we'd have, uh, like John, we'd rope off seats, uh, every second seat, but also have plexiglass partitions because one seat doesn't give it the required two meter uh, social distancing uh, that is, is required by law here. Uh, but there are cases where the uh, plexiglass uh, is, is being allowed as the way to, um, you know, give up a little bit on the two meters. And so we don't know if we'll be allowed to do that, but uh, we're talking about that. Uh, also, you know, for us, it's good that a lot of our, our vessels and our harbor hoppers are open air, as well as our double deckers in Niagara Falls are open air. So we just think that from a customer confidence point of view, gives a little bit more comfort to say, hey, you know, I, as long as I can, I sit up on the second level and, and we never had pre-assigned seating before and we will have that now. So when you buy a ticket, uh, you will go to a seat that is numbered and you clearly know where you're going to be before you get on. Um, yeah. Um, see, there's quite a few that have come in here. Uh, here's, here's one from Jessica. Um, is CLIA supposed to be putting out a protocol strategy uh, for all tour operators so it's consistent in each port? Do you guys know what the answer is on that one? I, I don't know the answer to that, sorry. Yeah, well, I don't know about CLIA, but I know that um, there's, there's one that came out last night that was endorsed by an, an incredible number of travel associations, uh, uh, NTA, and uh, it was probably a list of, I bet you, 10 or 12 different major uh, US-based uh, mostly uh, tr travel and tour associations and hospitality. And it, uh, it was very well done in terms of this, the uh, safety and social, social protocols. So uh, what I'll do, Tom and Larry, I'll, I'll send that to you immediately after the call, and then you can send that out uh, to everyone on the call. Okay. Yeah, certainly the more that the strategies and the requirements are consistent port over port, um, Frankly, I think the easier it is for not only tour operators, but also cruise lines. So they know, they, they know what the baseline is always. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, again, from, from Icy uh, Straight Point in Alaska, um, have either of you received specific requirements from cruise lines yet for cleaning guidelines, seating capacities or whatever? to prepare for the ships to start sailing again uh, in your destinations. Again, specific requirements directly from cruise lines. Um, we have not received specific requirements, but we have received requests as to what steps we're planning on taking. And um, right now it's, there's, I think that came from Disney. I'm not sure if any other cruise lines have reached out in that regard. Okay. Uh, same. Um, how will your tour guides communicate with guests if they are wearing masks? Um, as operators, what will you be doing differently? Because I think, John, you said that, that you require your, your conductors to wear masks, but the guests don't have to wear masks, I guess. Well, the, the way we set it up right now is they're required if they're within six feet of another person. If while they're on the tour, um, they're sitting in the front seat and facing forward, the next closest person because of roped off seats would probably be six feet behind them. So at that point, if the tour operator um, feels more comfortable removing the mask to, to better the quality of the tour and it's safe for he or she to do so, then they can do that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and and it, it, again, same with us. Uh, the the other difference is that, like uh, you know, our, our Harbor Hopper tour, for example, the the guide uh, is is facing the people, um, and that really is a wonderful dynamic to get the interaction going. Um, however, um, we're going to uh, try different things, and one of the things is, you know, having the tour guide. Um, sit in the front seat, the, the guide seat and, and uh, face forward, which won't make the tour as good, but uh, we think that it may be something that gives the people a little bit more confidence and they, they may not want someone, uh, you know, facing them talking. Um, and so we're going to try with masks, but we're also going to try without masks fa facing the other way and, and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, one other quick question. Um, I guess more specifically for you, John, is because you've already started up, how, how have you communicated? There's obviously been a lot of changes to, um, to the protocols for your conductors to, to conduct their tour. Um, what are the strategies you're using to communicate that to, to your frontline teams, the one, you know, the conductors, those people that are interfacing with the guests? Well, uh, as I mentioned, we we have the emails via constant contact where any updates are sent out to the cast that way. Um, we have our daily briefings in the morning where we go over the same points. We'll have additional signage in our facilities on the vehicles and at our depots. Okay. And um, w one question that I had, because I've, I've actually loaded um, a lot of buses in my day and <laughs> I'm not so sure how you get that first guest walking on the bus to go all the way to the back of the bus. <laughs> Do you have any well, uh, you know, strategies on that? <laughs> yeah, it's the best view in the back of the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> people, you know, Tom, we've been doing this a long time. I've joked with people for 23 years about this. They say, where's the best seat? Which side of the bus? I'm like, the inside. So, you know, I think it's just a matter of, you know, just, hey, it's a great view no matter where you are. And, you know, first come, first serve. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say there's probably going to be a, a little bit of, you know, uh, a trial and adjustment. And, and, and uh, like John says, you know, the use of humor can go a long way. And, uh, you know, good uh, tour guides can convince people of just about anything. But uh, while I have the floor for a moment, I just want to make a correction. Um, those safety protocols that came out, uh, I believe, last night, um, they were endorsed by CLIA and uh, the USTOA, okay. EPA, and, and uh, about a dozen others. So I just, I just sent them to you, you both, Tom and Larry. Okay. Uh, one other question here. I think we've covered most everything here. Uh, what are your plans for wristbands, tickets, uh, waivers, uh, and any touchless uh, kind of uh, thoughts? Well, for us, um, as far as like a ticket transaction is concerned, anybody that goes to our sales depot, um, if they're using a credit card, which we will encourage, we are not requiring them to sign the receipt. Um, a fair amount of people already purchase tickets online or by a different third party vendor. And that means that they have either a piece of paper that they just show to our staff or just simply hold up their phone with the ticket on it. Um, the only ones who will actually get a piece of paper for a ticket will be those going to one of our sales depots. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same. Same? Yeah. And I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, there are some questions about, uh, uh, wanted to get your thoughts on a visor instead of a mask. Would, would this kind of a face visor would, would be something you're looking at or are you just staying with the, with the mask for your uh, tour conductors? Uh, that I'm not aware of our company looking into that, but it's possible that they have been. I've just not been part of that conversation. You know, I can tell you from firsthand, you know, I spent the last six weeks before I come back to Boston and Key West where everybody was pretty much wearing a mask all the time. And coming back to Boston now, people are like, oh, it's fine now, but wait when it gets hot, it's going to be, no, it's no different. I wore this, have my mask on now. This is what I've worn for the past, you know, eight weeks. And it's, I wash it when I go home and I have the mask on all the time if I need it. And, and it looks good on you. <laughs> Thank you. So John's got the mask and Dennis has got the skirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but don't forget, I still have cookies too. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> one, one last question that just, just came in as well. Um, uh, are you measuring, are either of you measuring the guest's temperature? 
Is that part of your protocol? It's not been part of our protocols that, that um, I'm aware of, although our Nashville operation may implement it for their employees. So as part of the screening for employees, we may be doing that. I'm not aware of it being part of the protocols in the other cities though. And, and we are discussing it. I haven't decided on it, but we are uh, you know, thinking that it's something that we may try. We think it might uh, boost a little bit of uh, customer confidence knowing that uh, others have been measured, uh, their temperatures measured. Uh, I, I would just want to make a comment too that uh, I wish I could say that we had thought of the, the, the visors and we had not. And that's how great Destinations Together is because I have to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, that's one that we'll take from this and we'll, we'll take back because I think our tour guides should wear visors and face people. And, um, it, and they could do it with masks, but I think they could do it better with, with the full visor. And they could see the smile. Exactly. Right. And, and that, that, came on, that came across from our, our, our Q&A session right here. So that's great. It's really good. Um, Tom, we're at the 301 mark, so one, one more quick question. Okay, I have one more quick question uh, from Roger. Uh, do you have any plans regarding meeting guests in terminal buildings for tours? You know, which is kind of the traditional way we've done it uh, if they're not meeting on board. I'm sorry, what was that question? <laughs> uh, if you're meeting guests in the terminal. Like for instance in Boston, uh, you know, oftentimes you would, you know, people would would uh, meet in the terminal before you take them out to the buses. But I imagine that oh, protocol right. probably has to change a little bit. Yeah, um, well, the Boston port is very unique in that regard. I found out from traveling to Key West. So, um, okay. you know, we may at some point in time have had 200 people standing in line in Boston. I'm sure that will change. We haven't had any specific um, discussions about that, but I'm sure that will change. Uh, Key West is a different scenario because everything is outdoors. So um, I'm sure as things evolve, we'll figure out the best practices in that regard, making sure we're able to keep people distance um, appropriately. Yeah, and for us, everything is outdoors. We have no plans to uh, gather in, inside. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Wow, we a lot of great. questions. Thanks. Yeah, and we do have a few other comments that are floating around in the, the Q&A as well as the chat, and we'll pull those up and get them off to you, John and Dennis, as well. Um, and recommendations. So, um, but we want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your thoughts, plans, providing valuable information in regards to how you see reopening during these challenging times. And your presentations were great. And people have asked already if uh, we can provide the uh, the PowerPoint presentations to them. So we'll we'll check in with you guys later on that. Um, for all of our listeners today, we hope you will uh, join us again next Wednesday, May twentieth, at two o'clock for the science of sanitation. Get to know the coronavirus. What does it mean to be an envelope virus? How does it spread? Should you be afraid? How do you kill it? Learn the science behind disinfection and how electrostatic technology is your next best tool in the fight. In addition, you will learn all about the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council, GBAC, their signature GBAC STAR certification program, as well as their online training course to protect yourself, your staff, your customers, and your business. Please visit our website, www.destinationstogether.com and register for next week's webinar on Wednesday. And for those that have seen our emails, as far as our reminders, we've set it up as WOW, webinar on Wednesday. We wanna thank everybody for joining us today and those that provided questions, be strong. Dennis and John, again, thanks. Have a great day. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Th thank you both for being here to all the listeners out there on Zoom. Thanks for your support and participation. Until next time, stay healthy and take care of each other. Thank you.